Men of Iron. Chapter 31 It was not until the end of July that the High Court of Chivalry rendered its judgment. There were many unusual points in the case, some of which bore heavily against Lord Falworth, some of which were in his favour. He was very ably defended by the lawyers whom the Earl of Mackworth had engaged upon his side. Nevertheless, under ordinary circumstances, the judgment, no doubt, would have been quickly rendered against him. As it was, however, the circumstances were not ordinary. And it was rendered in his favour. The court besought the king to grant the ordeal by battle, to accept Lord Falworth's champion, and to appoint the time and place for the meeting. The decision must have been a most bitter, galling one for the sick king. He was naturally of a generous, forgiving nature. But Lord Falworth, in his time of power, had been an unrelenting and fearless opponent. And his majesty, who, like most generous men, could on occasion be very cruel and intolerant, had never quite forgiven him. He had steadily thrown the might of his influence with the court against the Falworth case, but that influence was no longer all-powerful for good or for ill. He was failing in health, and it could be a matter of only a few years, probably only a few months, before his successor sat upon the throne. On the other hand, the Prince of Wales faction had been steadily and of late quite rapidly increasing in power, and in the Earl of Mackworth, its virtual head, it possessed one of the most capable politicians and astute integrators in Europe. So, as the outcome of all the plotting and counterplotting, scheming and counter-scheming, the case was decided in Lord Falworth's favour. The knowledge of the ultimate result was known to the Prince of Wales' circle almost a week before it was fully decided. Indeed, the Earl of Mackworth had made pretty sure of the result before he had summoned Miles from France. But upon the king it fell like the shock of a sudden blow. All that day he kept himself in a moody seclusion, nursing his silent bitter anger, and making only one outbreak in which he swore by the holy rood that should Miles be worsted in the encounter he would not take the battle into his own hands, but would suffer him to be slain, and furthermore, that should the earl show signs of failing at any time he would do all in his power to save him. One of the courtiers who had been present, and who was secretly inclined to the Prince of Wales' faction, had repeated this speech at Scotland Yard, and the prince had said, hmm, That means, Miles, that she must win or die. And so I would have it, my lord, Miles answered. It was not until nearly a fortnight after the decision of the court of chivalry had been rendered that the king announced the time and place of the battle. The time to be the 3rd of September, the place to be Smithfield, a spot much used for such encounters. During the three weeks or so that intervened between this announcement and the time of combat, Miles went nearly every day to visit the lists and course of erection. Often the prince went with him, always two or three of his friends of the Scotland court accompanying him. The lists were laid out in the usual form. The true or principal list in which the combatants were to engage was sixty yards long and forty yards wide. This rectangular space was surrounded by a fence about six feet high, painted vermilion, between the fence and the stand where the king and the spectator sat, and surrounding the central space was the outer or fallen list. Also surrounded by a fence, in the false list, the constable and the marshals and the ma followers and attendants were to be stationed at the time of battle to preserve the general peace during the contest between the principals. One day, as Miles was princely patron and his friends entered the barriers, leaving their horses at the outer gate, they met the Earl of Alban and his followers, who were just quitting the lists, which they are also in the habit of visiting nearly every day. As the two parties passed one another, the Earl spoke to a gentleman walking beside him, and in a voice quite loud enough to be clearly overheard by the others. "'Oh, yonder is the young sprig of Falworth,' said he, his father.' My lord is not content with forfeiting his own life for treason, but must throw away his sons also. I have faced and overthrown many a better knight than that boy. Miles heard the speech, and knew that it was in fact intended for him to hear, but he paid no attention, walking composedly at the prince's side. The prince had also overheard it, and after a small space of silence asked, Do you not feel anxiety for your coming battle, Miles? Oh, yea, my lord, said Miles, 
Sometimes I do feel anxiety, but not such as my Lord of Albion would have had me feel in uttering that speech. It is anxiety of my father's sake and my mother's sake that I feel, for truly there are greater matters for them pending upon this fight. Nevertheless, I do know that God will not desert me in my cause, for verily my father is no traitor. But the Earl of Alban, said the prince gravely, is reputed one of the best skilled knights in all of England. Moreover, he is merciless and without generosity, so that if he does gain an advantage over her, he will surely slay you. I am not afraid, my lord, said Miles, still calmly and quite composedly. Mm, no am I afraid for you, Miles, said the prince heartily, putting his arm around the young man's shoulder. For truly, were ye a knight of forty years instead of one of twenty, I would not bear yourself with more courage. As the time of the duel approached, the days seemed to drag themselves along on leaden feet. Nevertheless, the days came, and the days went, as all days do, bringing with them at last the fateful third of September. Early in the morning, while the sun was still level and red, the prince himself, unattended, came to Miles' apartment, in the outer room of which Guskin was bustling busily about arranging the armour, piece by piece, renewing all the straps and thongs, but not whistling over his work as he usually did. The prince nodded to him, and then passed silently through to the inner chamber. Miles was upon his knees, and Father Ambrose, the prince's chaplain, was beside him. The prince stood silently at the door, until mying, Miles, having told his last bead, rose and turned toward him my dear lord said the young knight i give you gramercy for the great honour you do me in coming so early to visit me nay miles give me no thanks said the prince frankly reaching him his hand which miles took and said to his lips i lay thinking me of you this morning while yet in bed and so as i could not sleep at any more i was moved to come hither and to see you Quite a number of the prince's factions were at the breakfast at Scotland Yard that morning, among others the Earl of Mackworth. All were more or less oppressed with an anxiety, for nearly all of them had staked much upon the coming battle. If Albin conquered, he would be more powerful than ever, and to avenge himself upon them than ever. And Miles was a very young champion, upon whom so much depended. Miles himself showed his little anxiety, perhaps as any. He certainly ate more heartily of his breakfast that morning than many of the others could. At the meal that was ended, the prince rose. The boat is ready at the stairs, said he. If you would go to the tower to visit your father, Miles, before hearing mass, I and Calamande and Ver and Peons will go with you. If ye lords and gentlemen grant me your pardon for leaving you, are there any other that you would have accompany you? I would have Sir James Lee and my squire, Master Gascon, if you are so pleased to have them leave to go, said Miles. Mm, so be it, said the prince. We will stop at Mackworth Stairs for the night. The barge landed at the west stairs of the Tower Wharf, and the whole party was received with more than usual civilities by the governor, who conducted them at once to the tower, where Lord Falworth lodged. Lady Falworth met them at the head of the stairs, her eyes very red, and her face quite pale. And as Miles raised her hand and set a long kiss upon it, her lips trembled, and she turned her face away quite quickly, pressing her handkerchief for one moment to her eyes. The poor lady! What agony of anxiety and dread did she not suffer for her own boy's sake that day? Miles had not hidden from her, or his father, that he must either win the fight or die. As Miles turned from his mother, Prior Edward came out from inner chamber, and was greeted quite warmly by him. The old priest had arrived in London only the day before, having come down from Crosby Priory to be with his family and his friend, in this time of terrible anxiety. After a little while of general talk, the prince and his attendants retired, leaving the family together. Only Sir James Lee and Goskin remained behind. Many matters that had been discussed before were now finally settled, the chief of which was the disposition of Lady Falworth, in case the battle should go against them. Then Miles took his leave, kissing his mother, who began crying, and comforting her with the brave assurances 
Prior Edward accompanied him as far as the head of the tower stairs, where Miles kneeled on the stone steps, while the good priest blessed him and signed the cross upon his forehead. The prince was waiting in the walled garden, adjoining, and as they rode back again up the river to Scotland Yard, all were thoughtful and quite serious. Even peons and vares, merry tongues, were stilled from their usual quips and jesting. It was about the quarter of the hour before eleven o'clock, when Miles, with Guskin, set forth for the lists. The Prince of Wales, together with most of his court, had already gone on to the Smithfield, leaving behind him six young knights of his own household to act as escort to this young champion. Then at last the order to horse was given, the great grate swung open, and out they rode, chattering and jingling. The sunlight gleamed and flamed and flashed upon their polished armor. They drew rein to the right, and so rode in a little cloud of dust along Strand Street toward London Town, with the breeze blowing merrily and the sunlight shining as sweetly and blithesomely as though they were riding to a wedding, rather than to a grim and dreadful ordeal that would mean either O oh, sweet victory or O oh, grim 